the outset, I sincerely thank the organizers, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Salva Pandian, Dr. Santanam and others in the team for giving me one more opportunity to interact with the light crowd today. And again, in a diabetic conference, I am speaking on a, the second most common endocrinopathy, which is thyroid disorder in practical case scenario situations. In the next, uh, and uh, as the, uh, my previous speaker was alluding to, we are, be, we are given, I think, liberally a lot of time to discuss. I think uh, that's always the case with Dibicon, I suppose. So you can always stop at any time. You can uh, probably ask uh, questions or whatever comments in between also. The next uh, 15 or 20 slides will be briefly rushing through the common uh, situations in the sense the background in which we discuss thyroid disorders and uh, I have at least 15, 20 case scenarios in the last so that we'll uh, back and forth discuss the principles on which we treat these conditions. I'll go through the first few slides of uh, commonly encountered. I have, I won't uh, touch too much upon the thyroid nodules and thyrotoxicosis which is, we will discuss in some basics. But the most important problem and the most common of the thyroid disorders which we all know we face is hypothyroidism in its two forms. One is the clinical and subclinical. And recently there are a lot of uh, uh, mentions about hypothyroidism in pregnancy which I will discuss. But this slide is uh, right from our guide and days, first year MBBS. We have been uh, discussing about thyroid and this physiology of the thyroid always starts with this kind of a diagram. You can see the classic three-tire endocrine negative feedback mechanisms, hypothalamus controlling the pituitary, pituitary controlling the thyroid, thyroid secreting two hormones based on the number of iodine molecules, we classify them as T4 and T3. There could be a short loop or a long loop inhibition of both TSH and TRH respectively. And it, in this whole process, you can see that iodine plays a role in inside the thyroid. So if I show you too much of complexities inside how the thyroperoxidase antibodies, or sorry, the thyroperoxidase enzyme uh, takes up the iodine against the concentration gradient and couples it with the tyrosine molecule on the thyroglobulin protein, it looks more of chemistry. And I'm sure post-prandially in the evening you'll be too bored. Most of these negative feedbacks in endocrinology we discuss and you would have heard of it several times. The only extra point which many times we don't apply it in clinical practice is the quantitative relationship between this T4 and TSH. That means, for example, this being a diabetes conference, we can take some, some kind of uh, analogies from diabetes also. Is there any way we can relate what should be Suppose somebody's glucose is 80, what should be the insulin? Glucose is 150, what should be the insulin? Glucose is 200, what, how, how does the pancreas respond? Any answers? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying in units that this many units will come. At least the kind of relations. So like, suppose for 150 milligram glucose in the blood, insulin is one unit. What will be for 200? It'll, will it be 1.5 or 2 or 3 or 10 or 20? I mean, I'm just asking the, the relationship. Is it arithmetic or logarithmic, which is exponential or any guesses? Actually, I don't know the answer, frankly. But I can tell you that with respect to other endocrine glands, especially thyroid and calcium parathormone, it is always exponential, which means if you, I'm sorry, which you have, if you have one unit reduction reduction in the level of T4, the TSH will not go up by one unit. The TSH will go up by 100 units or whatever. It is exponential. If you draw that graph, it will be a steep curve. How many of you remember this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve I done? All these curves are always, you know, they have a small plateau at some point, but suddenly they'll go very steep up. I think it's insulin also somewhat similar, if not exactly the same. But we don't, we can't quantify. That's why sometimes people check fasting, insulin, and glucose in individual patients uh, for whatever insulin resistance or other methodology uh, calculations, which is probably not very useful in individual patients. As an epidemiological parameter, the glucose to insulin ratio is probably useful. But if you check, uh, start checking each person's fasting insulin and fasting glucose, each will, each will vary. You don't know what glucose is insulin. We know that below 70, insulin can get shut off. 
by below below 60 when you are becoming relatively more and more hypoglycemic your insulin should get shut off this is the only thing we know and when your sugars are high your insulin should go high but how high how much high is that normal for you all these are based on nomograms which many times we don't have in our bedside to say that okay for this this is the this is what it is but here so that's why you see lab reports sometimes the classic t4 uh, reports in a total t4 values will be usually 4.5 to 12.5 this is the usual cutoff they will give you and tsh will be usually 0.35 to 5.5 in most of the commercial kits labs i'm not discussing lab errors here i'm just discussing uh, physiology so if your t4 is less than 4.5 which is very low your tsh which should be 5.5 is the upper limit should not be at 6 7 8 it should be 70 80 100 like that i mean just giving you a very arbitrary number but that is the way you should look at the t4 so next time you see a t4 value which is very low low means lower than the lower limit of normal of the lab then the tsh should be very high is the only word i can use it should not remain at single digit 6.8 7.8 many times you'll see these kind of numbers that's the only learning point from this feedback i'm not showing you the graph but just to remember so let us take one scenario to start off the discussion this is very commonly encountered young lady currently unmarried, weight gain and irregular cycles are her presenting symptoms. And she met her family physician who checked her thyroid functions and somewhat similar to what I discussed. Is this physiologically explainable report? For all our practical purpose, yes. See the T4 is lower than the lower limit and the TSH has crossed pretty much above 10, 20, whatever. It's actually going quite high. Suppose this value was 5.8 which is outside the limit, but that's not the way we should look at it. Then it means there is something wrong with TSH. Why is it not going high is the question I'll ask. That means there is not, there is not, so usually we expect the TSH to go very high, but that means pituitary is functioning well. If the TSH does not show this kind of response, many times you'll get values like more than 100, more than 150, this is the way the number should go. That's how it should be. So this uh, lady, I think it's a straightforward diagnosis. I'm sure all the doctors in this room will know. This is primary hypothyroidism. It's confusing sometimes to clinicians. Primary here in endocrinology means not, it is not secondary to infection, secondary to this. The primary means the gland is involved. If I say primary adrenal problem, primary adrenal failure means adrenal gland is in problem. Not that the adrenal is involved secondary to pituitary. If ACTH goes also, adrenal gland can, can, can get affected. If pituitary is affected also, thyroid gland can get affected. Then it is called secondary hypothyroidism. It's not the way. So the primary or thyro thyroid specific uh, means primary hypothyroidism means primarily the thyroid gland is affected. What is the etiology is not told in this diagnosis. By primary hypothyroidism, we mean that the gland is not functioning well. Gl the gland is going down in its function. Etiology, we will come to in the next few slides. We have several discussions on that. This slide is deliberately put to tell us and remind us that this is not the way we should be diagnosing hypothyroidism. By the way, the slide is 1948, not recent. Okay, these are all classic descriptions which you all know. In fact, there is a standard textbook of uh, clinical medicine. I'm not sure how many of you, it's called Butterworth, like Hutchison and uh, your Chamberlain and uh, similar books. There's one book called Butterworth where that author, in, that was written before 1980s. Every uh, chapter will have several pictures. And he writes in the hypothyroid chapters that it is better to follow up thyroid patients on treatment with serial photographs, not with biochemistry, because that was the time when chemistry was not available. And he says that it is better to have photographs. As you can see here on treatment, this man who was grossly mixed matters, it is picked up on, from that book only. You can see how much of a difference it can make within few months. This is all we know. This is the, this is the extremes of gross myxedema, which is uh, well known to all of us. But uh, that is one extreme. I'm sure um, uh, you will be diagnosing it once in a while. And every time, uh, but the reverse is true. If you, if you, there are a lot of people today who are obese, whose uh, face looks uh, grossly swollen up or at least puffy, and you start checking thyroid on everybody. Obesity is too common a problem, we all know. Now, how many times you pick up thyroid uh, hypothyroidism? Any guess? I'm sure even in this room, there will be so, uh, many people who will fit the Indian definition of uh, obesity. And if I start checking thyroid on everybody, I'm sure um, some of you 
so how many percentage will have uh, thyroid abnormality here i want to add one more catch uh, point there i'll go into these are all easy to understand but the newer nuances are any guess in fact the standard american thyroid association uh, website patient information page mentions a very nice point obesity weight gain and thyroid are only 3 to 5% related this is a very devastating statement to make to a patient who comes to us for obesity and she will think that she or he will think that the tsh which was raised above normal uh, is the main reason for her uh, weight gain because somebody might have told that there is a thyroid problem and uh, right from 10th uh, standard uh, school textbooks it is written the thyroid problem and obesity are related but the quantitative relationship again is very weak gross mixed edema see this man suppose this man came to us uh, 10 years before before development of this how much how much of uh, uh, fat gain fat not water that's the unfortunate uh, problem with thyroid mixed edema the word itself includes the word called edema that word edema, edema we all know is uh, water retention where, where, where did it come in hypothyroidism and when we define obesity BMI based definition or Y circumference based definition or by DEXA scan, MRI, whatever definition, what is the definition of obesity? We don't include water there. We include only fat. And what is the relation between thyroid and fat? Very little. Maybe 3 to 5 percent. Again. So you will lose this water. So basically, in fact, it's used to be our ward rounds question uh, during training. So if you treat this kind of a grossly mixed hematous uh, patient with thyroxine, what will be the first response seen? It will be actually polyuria. If you can document his 24-hour urine for the next few days, he will start having more urine excretion. Most of the endocrinopathies, in fact, ex except for uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, where you are treating their polyuria, because you have to recover, the patient has to recover from polyuria. In all others, you treat acromegaly, you treat Cushing's, you treat hypothyroidism, the first response will be polyuria, because of these kind of effects. The glycosaminoglycans, which are highly hygroscopic, retain a lot of water, and that's why the typical non-pitting edema, classic textbook clinical description, uh, will happen, and that will be the first to go. If at all you want to treat uh, hypothyroidism, is this clinical medicine? I'm not talking now TSH and T4. What will happen and those kind of things? So basically, this water retention will go, and in children especially, this will be very prominent. And that ch child who, which looked really abnormal and flabby, will start looking more lean, and the child will also grow because of the thyroxine replacement. So it will appear like the child has uh, lost a lot of weight. So it will be very prominent in a child which looked very chubby and stout and short. Uh, suddenly becoming lean and uh, taller. So that is very dramatic. So that's this cross description we always say, uh, thyroid potenta, weight koreyo, you know, on all things. All these things are sometimes, you know, not very easy to digest, especially in adults. Grossly obese adult, next time you see, or you don't see, somebody is calling you or phone also, you can tell them that it's not due to thyroid. <laughs> morbid obesity is never, you see the causes for morbid obesity, where does thyroid come? It won't be listed. You see standard textbooks. It won't be there. So that's the... So basically what do we assess when the patient comes clean? Even though they might have come for obesity or irregular cycles or whatever, our idea is to check not only whether the child... Uh, the, because many times as uh, so-called specialists today, we see patients with these kind of reports. We don't see patients with this history alone many times. They'll come to most often the primary physician. And after some abnormality, they will start coming, uh, start searching for physicians, other physicians. So in that way, if you see, our idea is to see whether there is any cause. Most of the hypothyroidism which you see in general practice is autoimmune, unless proved otherwise. What are the unless proved otherwise? The otherwise conditions are these. Other medical problems. Which medical problem? For example, psychiatric problem, lithium, or uh, atrial fibrillation, rheumatic heart disease, whatever, amiodarone or neck surgeries, which is obvious if you have that history, radiation, or the patient is on some pills. So some of the indications or some of the causes of hypothyroidism other than autoimmune, you can easily elicit in the history. And that's what we do when, we, the, when the patient comes. And some of these history is very obvious. You have a scar in the neck. And on examination, our idea is to see whether there is any goiter or nodule and other signs of autoimmunity. The importance of this last word I stressed is some of the autoimmune conditions are very common, especially skin conditions, alopecia, areata, vitiligo. These kind of conditions are pretty common that if somebody has this history, 
the relevance of this is this lady might have got treated for alopecia areata by a dermatologist or vitiligo in at her 15 teens and she'll come to you at 30 she would have forgotten that those conditions are gone and now you see her with hypothyroidism again you have an obvious story that there is autoimmunity in the background so such a patient so the idea of these two slides is two two important points one is hypothyroidism most often it is autoimmune it is not due to iodine deficiency by the way please understand that in, even in the iodine deficiency belt except in gross situations where the iodine is literally undetectable you don't have hypothyroidism happening due to iodine deficiency today especially in coastal areas after universal iodization now we talk of other controversies like iod over iodization of uh, the population as well as uh, certain other things ah, by the way in obesity i wanted to mention one more point this will be very paradoxical to what we discuss obesity which is fat excess will cause tsh elevation this is a well described condition so mild tsh elevation is probably due to obesity rather than the reverse so next time you start before prescribing 125 microgram or some some very mild dose or slow low dose something we have to think in we, in what justification are we doing it probably we have to think and we will get, go through some other scenarios you will again re-emphasize these same facts so the treatment usually is this pan dosing of uh, many of our patients with the same dose of 100 microgram i don't want to name the brand name most often we write that 100 microgram od as only one dose for many of our patients should be actually avoided depending on the weight of the patient even in an adult practice it is worthwhile to remember this uh, microgram per kg dosing because you will have some adults who are very lean also sometimes they'll be only 35 or less than 40 kg uh, and in those situations a 75 microgram tablet will be probably better than prescribing them the standard 100 microgram because many of our patients including re yesterday and today we had pay i have seen patients they don't follow up with us once started never checked because it's because they don't directly realize the symptoms of this and over treatment is also harmful and that's the unfortunate story with thyroid it's not like some of our other uh, probably some supplements this is not a supplement this is replacement scientific replacement and this is a very important practice point to remember uh, during replacement with thyroxine never we should prescribe it should be taken always alone in empty stomach not with any other medications probably which can interfere most commonly today it is universal omeprazolization of patients i suppose if i have to put it in a very too many patients are on that medication for various uh, upper gi non-specific complaints so it can interfere with thyroid absorption once upon a time i'm i'm sure senior physicians sitting here they might have prescribed a lot of antacids in pregnancy we have iron preparations given calcium given so all of this and probably i can put it this way that anything including food including tea coffee whatever they take there should be a minimum gap of 30 to 45 minutes it, this is highly strict and disciplined way of taking but whenever we say this kind of disciplined way of taking no then our americans will start jumping because once upon a time we in diabetes also i am sure uh, we used to think of you no know, diet exercise but today you say any drug can be taken any time you know today we have such kind of drugs if i have to put it in a very different lateral awkward way of thinking we are bringing in indiscipline into the treatment of the you know disciplined diabetes eating probably same way in the thyroid patient some of our patients probably but most of our indian patients are probably really really obedient they follow our rules except uh, their exceptions but why i quoted in a, this way is because there are american studies now published to tell us that you can give it at night it is better always to give it this way because they have what is called the supper and dinner the, there is a big time gap you know, which we don't have and they probably take it after that in general in india the universal rule is to take it in empty stomach give a gap of 30 to 40 minutes do not take any other preparations including beverages with this and this question of soya
soya interferes with iodine absorption also and soya interferes with thyroxine absorption also so it is an absorption problem it is not that soya causes hypothyroidism or something so you can take soya after 2 3 hours of taking the thyroxine tablet na inik adhu or fashion aayidhu this you know tetra pack milk soya milk adala kudikinu inda aasai la didikinu varum and specifically our hypothyroid patients only cause all this because they read too many you know magazines and other things they are only aware of this. so this is in general in any adult both males and females except in these special situations you can see there puberty pregnancy menopausal period patients on oral contraceptives or other hormonal preparations and and fortunately this malabsorption phenomena is relatively rare in india but anyway you have exceptions always so unless these situations are there out of which i think you will very commonly encounter pregnancy and puberty so i see a child with hypothyroidism during her her or his pubertal change the dosing will increase we have to remember and the dose is not the same as the same rule and this very curious to note that the children the requirements are always higher in thyroxine yeah a yeah, newborn child the requirement is 15 to 10 to 15 microgram per kg see the adult dosing 1.5 to 2 it's almost 10 times so children always higher and it gradually reduces and after puberty it stabilizes around this so i hope i conveyed uh, some of these important messages so next time you see a very lean low uh, bmi patient which also we see you know in you now once in a while don't prescribe them higher dose of thyroxine because higher doses also have problems so which is the best parameter to monitor the same logic the first quantitative relationship between tsh and t4 i discussed for the same reason both diagnosis and monitoring of primary hypothyroidism it is one and only tsh need not do t3 by the way t3 t4 tsh nu motha motha order pandrom ana adule or logic irukku in the logic is not scientific it is more of cost i know couple of labs some of them are very near by this place uh, where the the profile as a whole is cheaper than doing one alone i am not joking i can quote you the lab also if you want after the meeting so t4 tsh especially free t4 tsh will be costlier than doing free t3 free t4 tsh as thyroid profile idu vandha enna logic la enna kekadinga because these packages are recent phenomena in medical science today i am discussing science science buddy only tsh is enough but logistics for the lab purpose or some cost issues you can always order all the three together for some other funny reason but if you ask me which is the only test you will do for diagnosing primary hypothyroidism nobody should say t4 t3 la it's only tsh and if i ask you which is the only test you will do to monitor a patient with hypothyroidism it is only tsh and the goal is usually this this is uh, typical uh, american cut off uh, but just to tell you that some of the labs are different in one or so if i have to quote it in a more broader way keep it in the lower half of the range of that lab is a better statement 2.5 is the usual cut off because most of the labs in the us are 5 and our labs are also 5.5 as the upper limit so somewhere around 2.5 should be our aim if at all we have to be very strict like the hb1c what is your goal ni kata correct and the same and the mari you have to remember some number for our guidance but in a given situation based on the age and other parameters you can relax or tighten this criteria as i have written here t3 or t4 total free nothing is necessary to diagnose not necessary vote for diagnosis and monitoring and once a stable once stabilized at this range and the patient is very compliant they usually ask how often you should check the thyroid level like i i see a patient suppose 35 or 40 year old lady she has completed her family menses is reasonably regular no other comorbid issues she is a hypothyroid she is on this 125 microgram of thyroxine and her tsh is 2.8 i am happy with that she is also happy call her after one year but suppose i see this case scenario of 22 year old lady unmarried she may get married in the next few months she may plan pregnancy then it should be more frequent that's where you should use your clinical judgment and depending on the situation so i a male patient uh, where these kind of other physiological uh, issues don't come probably once in a year is enough but all this will depend on the compliance of the patient please very important last point dose adjustment should not be made on symptoms 
very very common in general practice i have heard several of our physician friends telling us adha pada pada kudu andha patient adnala konjam korachiten konjam weight yerna mari irundhadhu konjam yethi utten menses konjam olunga varala one dose maathiten very very common in our practice absolutely unscientific because from whatever discussions we are making i am sure you will learn this point that we have clear today because this tsh assays are highly sensitive i'm sure in the lab report also you'll see ultra sensitive tsh assay ne idirukum most of the good commercial labs they will also write tsh fourth generation ne eduvanga nare per highly sensitive the the assay reliability is very good today from any decent lab so you can understand how sensitive is the test so how reliable is the test so you have to go by that parameter and keep it in the range of the lab if i have to quote british thyroid association that will be not this that will be range of the lab in kuduthirukom american uh, thyroid association guideline la indha mari 2.5 nu kuduthu you follow but keep it in the range preferably the lower half that is the best answer and if somebody ask you want something more specific it's 2.5 don't adjust dosage by symptoms go only by this yeah okay then the very common question asked by our patients is evlo naal life long a doctor the answer is very grossly written here you can have n number of uh, uh, long term follow up studies are very few uh, only one major uh, f- long term follow up studies the wickham survey done in the uk where they found out this kind of a thing that this is an autoimmune process now i will come to some pathology discussion also just couple of points because primary hypothyroidism hashimoto in the vaarthai la appa kaadla vilundinde irukum hashimoto thyroiditis chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis autoimmune thyroiditis causing hypothyroidism ella onnu da no difference they are all just different different terms for the same condition so you say whether hashimoto or aitd autoimmune thyroid disease hypothyroid ella onnu da so it being an autoimmune phenomena like any other autoimmune disease unless the immuno inflammatory destruction of the thyroid is permanent you always have a chance for recovery if a rheumatoid arthritis patient if they were rheumatologist inga pesindarna enna solvaru early rheumatoid arthritis you would have seen in disease modifying drug inga rom recovery la possible dhaan pesa mudiyum you can't say no for anybody some people they will say enak adu appale seriya poyirudhu why not how many of you have seen vitiligo and alopecia areata and all recovering in some patients i'm sure there will be spontaneous remission is possible in all these reversible immunological conditions whether it is due to your medication or due to some other intervention i don't know but spontaneity is also known and that's also possible in hypothyroidism up to the tune of 20 to 25 percent but invariably 70 percent of the patients like in any other endocrinopathy even in beta cell for example unless 80 90 percent of the gland is destroyed you don't develop the disease this applies to kidney failure also it applies to any other uh, uh, organ in our body so unless 80 90% of the thyroid gland is totally affected you don't develop hypothyroidism because the remaining gland will always cope so if i have to put it in another way if the lymphocytic thyroiditis is damaging the thyroid so badly they will go into perm- which happens in 70% of the case so they go into permanent hypothyroidism but you can see here there are two three unique situations 5 to 10% of cases it can switch over because after all an autoimmune phenomenon today it is an understanding in thyroidology is that the graves disease which is severe the classic example of hyperthyroidism is one end of the spectrum hypothyroidism which is hashimoto or autoimmune hypothyroidism is in the other end if you have auto antibodies thyroid blocking antibodies which are predominant you develop hashimoto if you have thyroid stimulating antibodies which are predominant you develop graves disease and the same person the same lymphocytes can produce both you can switch over from this to this or this to this that's why you will see many of the graves disease patient becoming hypothyroid the, the the natural history of graves disease is they will become hashimoto 5% of hashimoto can become graves but na peer yen sonna na just ungala kolapradhukaga adha but basically it's it's a mixture of both the antibodies in the same patient whichever predominates that response will come but unfortunately we don't have the antibody testing directly available for these these are all research settings but this is the in simplest way in which you can understand that it is both are autoimmune conditions i am not discussing nodules here i am not discussing cancers here please understand and i am not discussing drug induced problems here leave it i am talking the typical classic naive graves disease or hypothyroidism patient so idella ella mix up varum 
in in some situations nodules inga namma kondu varakudad nodules can become differently so you can always tell our patients reasonably that you have a 10 15% chance of recovery also just to give them some hope so that you know and especially it is true in some of the postpartum thyroiditis patients okay why are we worried about treating hypothyroidism one is symptoms if they are grossly symptomatic ed matters adala namo illa but long term la it affects all the components of our metabolic syndrome as well as it affects every organ system in some way or the other especially it's being a female predominant disease and if if, if it affects the reproductive system it has lot of connotations so for these issues we have to treat hypothyroidism but the one catch point which i told you initially also that over treatment is also bad long term over treatment which is very common in our situation and the brand pair sollala thyroxin one odin potrupom adu varsha kanaga potu tsh always less than 0.1 is directly detrimental to both heart and bones you will not believe that most of our osteoporosis might be in hypothyroid patients will be over treatment related over treatment causes hypothyroid i mean osteoporosis it is not the if you keep around 2.5 or within the range and keep it normal you are not producing any disease please understand many very often sir thyroxine edinale calcium kuda eludanuma indha mari doubt la nare perku varudhu the answer is unfortunately over treatment is leading to bone problem so we are forced to say that sometimes you know you 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 prescribe but that's not the answer the scientific answer is you treat it correctly you don't need to prescribe calcium with thyroxine and another important uh, uh, complication of over treatment over replacement see this is not hyperthyroidism by the way i na sollumbode over treatment over replacement endha solrenga adu hyperthyroidism illa it's not a gland is producing you are doing this hydrogenic so tsh less than 0.1 for a long time will cause atrial fibrillation id id rendu always proven proven scientific facts adanal da na nariya i am not quoting journal paper uh, all those uh, quotations are idella proven book uh, facts atrial fibrillation and osteoporosis are complications of over treatment of hypothyroidism so that's the importance of at least checking even in a regular compliant patient you have to check at least once a year or two to show that the values are always kept normal now going to the second case 24 year old lady instead of that unmarried lady we are having a married lady now checks her thyroid functions because somebody noticed her that her neck was slightly more prominent she undergoes the moster health checkup and she is, she has no other illness her thyroid t4 is normal that is within the range of the lab see the tsh idu epdi vandudu what is the diagnosis i'm sure you know the diagnosis but the approach to this is much more slightly more complicated than how we approach the first patient which is gross hypothyroidism so what will you do what are the issues how can you have normal t4 and the tsh is high number one most common answer lab error adha namba inga solla kudade i'm not joking if you have to first recheck this is very unfortunate but அது நம்ம அது ஒரு ப்ராக்டிகல் பாயிண்டாக ஓரமாக வச்சுருவோம் நவு டிஸ்கஸ் சயின்ஸ் லேபரர் இல்லை நிஜமாகவே டிஎஸ்ஹெச் கேன் கோ ஹை ஹவு இட் கேன் கோ ஹை த சேம் ரிலேஷன்ஷிப் விச் வி டிஸ்கஸ்ட் இனிஷியலி வென் த டி ஃபோர் இஸ் கோயிங் லோ பை ஒன் பேராமீட்டர் டிஎஸ்ஹெச் வில் கோ அப் பை டென் டு டுவெண்ட்டி ஆர் ஹண்ட்ரட் பேராமீட்டர் ஸோ ஈவன் சப்போஸ் திஸ் லேடிஸ் டிஎஸ்ஹெச் வாஸ் உட் ஹவ் பின் நைன் பாயிண்ட் ஃபைவ் ஆர் சம்திங் சம் டூ த்ரீ இயர்ஸ் பேக் ஃப்ரம் நைன் பாயிண்ட் ஃபைவ் ஆர் டென் இட் உட் ஹவ் கம் டவுன் டு செவன் பாயிண்ட் எயிட் which means that's the average we are discussing so even though t4 is falling within the range that will be sensed by the pituitary and the tsh is going up this is the way they react it's exquisitely sensitive i'm sure uh, i mean unless you see those kind of uh, situations more often you won't realize it's the same with calcium i'm sure it's the same with insulin also glucose konja erna kuda your body is supposed to produce uh, insulin for that every minute to minute there is a, a protection so the same way here also you can see that that's this is why previously they called it the tsh is going up and compensating id epdina the beta cell is compensating and keeping your glucose normal in the pre diabetes igt la adana solrom andha mari id insulin is i mean tsh is going up to keep your t4 normal and gradually and are the type 2 diabetes la beta cell is going down adhe mari inga gradually the autoimmune disease thyroid is going down and down and one day the thyroid cannot compensate and that day you have the tsh going very high 
this is the logic. So this is basically, but there are other differential diagnoses for this whole situation. But we, because autoimmune thyroid disease is the most common, we always discuss evolving autoimmune thyroid disease as the first differential for this kind of a normal T4 and elevated TSH, which is usually called subclinical hypothyroidism. But there is nothing clinical about it, because it is usually a lab definition. Subclinical, uh, you know, uh, we, we always associated something, you know, symptom miracle. So some purists in the endocrine you know, uh, literature, they discuss this as normothyroxinemic hyperthyrotropinemia. Just to tell you, that's normal T4, hyper. But just to tell you that elevated TSH, that's what I Compensated. The other conditions are recovering thyroiditis, recovering from recent stress, very, very common. This, I think we as a, I will spend one more minute on this because if you have a, uh, see, the, very often I see this uh, middle-aged and elderly people, Paiyan vandha America larga, ponnu vandhu kalyana hai paita, yunga taniya arganga, oru fever ondha alayenga bayam oru. Oru sadharna viral fever dhaan arukkoon, anna two, three days la recover all in, they get panicky and uh, they go for checkup. Why should we check only for the fever? Check the whole body check up. So the usual funda, what happens? You are recovering from one illness. During that recovering phase, maybe they, it, it, it is delayed by few more days than what they expect. In that recovering period, if you check the thyroid, it will be always abnormal. Two abnormalities can occur. You can either have TSH suppression also or TSH elevation. How TSH suppression it will be viral thyroiditis. It would have been a viral infection and her viral uh, grand, uh, glandular problem, so thyroxin get uh, TSH get suppressed. Or it wouldn't have been a thyroid disease at all. But because of the illness, the thyroid is reacting and she is recovering and the TSH will go high. Ideally, you are supposed to repeat. So all these subclinical hypothyroidism cases, first time they come to you, unless they are pregnant, there is no indication to treat. You always wait, repeat after a few weeks. You will probably from a different lab, if I have to quote it in a very crude way, because you will double confirm the whole thing. And if there is a recovering phase also, you will know the gland, the whole thing will uh, become normal. So some of these practical points is, when you have this in the differential diagnosis, please repeat it after some time. And I won't go into some of the other uncommon things like even adrenal failure can cause TSH elevation because cortisol normally suppresses TSH and the certain drugs can also cause elevated TSH. So you have a, uh, yeah, quite a few differentials for why TSH can be high but still T4 can be normal. So basically we, what we do, if all those secondary or whatever other causes are ruled out, you have to be objective assessment of symptoms. Goit, objective, na, the, the catch word is objective here. You have weak, arke, tired, arke, moody, kutthu, back pain, weight air, you have every other vague symptom your patient may complain. How to quantify? You have some visual analog scale. Because all these other things, if they are there, then it is a big pointer. For example, goiter, family history of thyroid disease, other autoimmune conditions, dyslipidemia, coronary artery disease, the last two are very, very important, pregnancy especially. There are absolute indications to treat. But if you have any of these pointers, then you have to closely monitor the patient, show that the TSH is climbing up in the next few weeks and then start treatment. Except in pregnancy where you have to, you don't have time, so you better start treating. In all other situations, go through this checklist. If the patient has any two, three of these things, then there is a definite indication probably that patient should be treated. So every TSH elevation should not be treated. If you have these conditions, then you treat. That's the idea. The another common extra investigation we do in these kind of patients is thyroid microsomal antibody. That's the same as peroxidase antibody. Most of the microsome is filled up with peroxidase. So microsomal and peroxidase are almost synonymous. And uh, this antibody is a surrogate marker of the underlying autoimmunity. It is not causing hypothyroidism, but it is a marker that the child, I mean, that the patient is undergoing autoimmune damage to the pancreas, to the thyroid. So we are confirming autoimmunity, that's all. We are not confirming thyroid disease here. There are a lot of general population people, 5 to 10 percent of general population can have antibody positivity, but they will not have hypothyroidism. So if a hypothyroid patient has antibody positivity, we know that definitely it is autoimmune damage. The reverse is not true. You have autoimmunity positive, but still. You can have sometimes this GAD antibody positive even in a small subset of general population. That does not mean they have type 1 diabetes. 
the same way. If you are type 1 diabetes like add antibody high on this, we always jump. Yeah, yeah, that is autoimmunity. But you also have type 1B diabetes. Without autoimmunity also, you can have type 1 diabetes. So, the latest guidelines and the latest 2005, that's the latest. So, 2005 will end the guideline now. If somebody has normal T4 with elevated TSH, the usual dictum is to treat, provided you have any other reasons not to treat. In general, you treat. 5 to 10 is the most uh, gray area in thyroid practice. That we have to individualize. How will you individualize? Based on these factors. You individualize and if you have more points, you treat. Otherwise, you better wait. But please remember, over treatment of thyro with thyroxine in every patient is harmful. What is that harm? We have already discussed. If the TSH gets suppressed, you will have bone problem. Unfortunately, both are silent. Bone problem is silent. Later fibrillation or or unless you check the pulse rate for every patient. So that's and in pregnancy, just to tell you that uh, I don't think you need to read uh, every line here. It may be too small from the back. Pregnancy and hypothyroidism are a very very important association today, and uh, most of the guidelines are heavily stressing on one point that we probably have to treat everybody who has a TSH above 2.5. The aim of therapy in pregnancy is to keep the TSH below 2.5. Higher TSH or that untreated hypothyroidism is associated with abortions, preterm deliveries, PAH, GDM, and several complications of the probably the fetus also. So for all the associations, association does not mean causation. So the, 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 for all these kind of associations, it is better to treat pregnant ladies who have TSH elevation and there I think again the goal is to keep below 2.5 and uh, the dosing so one important message is at least in your patients who are in the reproductive age who are not yet become pregnant if they become pregnant they stop their auction some of our pregnant ladies fertility uh, absolutely that you have to counsel them again and again that you should not stop in fact the dosing will go high because of the increased uh, uh, estrogen, uh, I mean, thyroid binding globulins. I think uh, thyroid toxic, we'll go through case in, I think, only 15, 10 minutes more. Some of these cases I'll skip and go to, because this comes in the case also. also. Number case, yeah. I think I'll, I'll ask few people, I'm some, some people are half asleep, I suppose. Uh, the reliability of total T4 in even in a peripheral setting is much, much higher than free T4 assays. Free T4 assays are more difficult to maintain. So unless you get a free T4 value from a, a, a lab which you know about the quality, it's better to rely on total T4. So you can see here free T4 is higher because we, we assume in these discussions that they are all from the best labs. And TSH is suppressed. This is thyrotoxicosis. By the way, thyrotoxicosis means blood levels of thyroid hormones are more. It does not mean the gland is overproducing. That's why we said the word overtreatment when we said overtreatment with thyroxine. Gland is not producing, you are overtreating. That also will produce the same picture. Okay. The next step in every thyrotoxicosis, unless there is contraindication, is to get a technetium scan or a radioiodine uptake scan. This is the uptake scan. This is the neck. These are all salivary glands and minor salivary glands, they also take up technetium. And this is heart, by the way. So, technetium scan should show the normal thyroid, something like this. This is normal thyroid, how it appears in the technetium scan. Here you are not seeing no uptake in the technetium scan, which means what? Hydrogenic, hydrogenic, the, the, the Minadi, see this is the case scenario, she is uh, in the reproductive age, she has all signs of toxicosis, symptoms and she also has a goiter clinically and she has this report in the blood which is clearly high T4, low TSH, explainable, high T4, low T, it's not the other way around and she under, the next step is to get a scan, not ultrasound scan, no, sorry, ultrasound scan panna kudadi. Commercially, unfortunately, most of our people are getting ultrasound scan, which is the most unfortunate thing to happen. Now, remember, superlative, I'm adjectives. 
because I want to convey this message, do not do ultrasound scan in every thyroid patient. Unless you are suspecting nodule, thyroid or ore ultrasound ore, it is a nodule. Da. Thyrotoxicosis ke aro ultrasound scan panna kudad. Diffuse goiter clinically do not do ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan ana easily available pakat layer kum adalana othing na. There are a lot of papers also published na. But if you have an access, you please do nuclear scan, which is technetium scan or uh, radioiodine uptake scan. Adil over difference irke. Theoretically, if you want, I can mention radiodine uptake scan is first of all more costly. The patient has to come twice. Oruati nige kudu kono naal ke 24 hours ke chhuvar or uptake pono. Are they technetium scan on the ore and all the muchilla? Any time of the day, no need for any fasting, anything. If I want to go to technetium scan, one hour report on the you have an uptake within uh, easily. So that's why we do this. And the just to tell you that normally, when the gland is over functioning, the salivary glands won't be seen, only the thyroid will be seen. When the gland is normally functioning, both salivary glands and thyroid will be seen like this. But here you are seeing that there is no thyroid. So what is the answer? Technetium and iodine are uh, chemistry-wise same, which means the whenever iodine can go through the thyroid and the sodium iodide uh, channel, same way technetium can also go in. That means what? It's not going in. The gland is inflamed. The gland is undergoing a damage. The gland, if it was overproducing, then it will take up technetium. When the gland is damaged, that means it is leaking the already stored thyroxine. That's why it is not taking up. So it's a very simple test. You give a small dose of technetium to that patient or iodine, IE131 or IE125, whichever the, gland, the, the, the lab is using. When the gland takes up, it means it is hyperthyroidism. The gland is churning out more thyroxine. But when the gland is not taking up technetium, that means what? It is damaged. Thyroiditis. In the thyroiditis, it could be autoimmune, it could be viral, it could be radiation, it could be drug, it could be injury, handling, whatever. Like you, I do a scan, the patient underwent uh, parathyroidectomy. Uh, the, during parathyroidectomy, they will always you know, uh, turn the thyroid this way and that way. So that's handling of the thyroid. They are not doing thyroid surgery. If you do a scan on the patient, you can Thyroiditis, because of the handling, thyroiditis. If it is a viral infection, you can have thyroiditis. Then the famous term, dequirements thyroiditis. Subacute thyroiditis. You have a drug induced thyroiditis, same thing will happen. So, suppose amiodarone, high dose, iodine induced thyroiditis, same picture will come. So, no gland uptake. So, we are confirming thyroiditis in this patient, which is a self limiting condition. The whole idea of telling you this is. You should not be treating this with anti-thyroid drugs. You should only give symptomatic treatment if at all she is, so beta blockers may be enough. And repeat the thyroid test after 6 to 12 weeks, she will be usually euthyroid. Or sometimes the viral thyroiditis damage can be so severe that they can go into hypothyroids. So if the toxic phase was uh, very marginal that she didn't come to us, she will pass through this toxic phase and come to us only with the hypothyroid. That could have been a damage after thyroiditis. So this is thyroiditis you are seeing with the toxic phase. In an area ladies in in gynec practice, postpartum thyroiditis no condition. Except that except in the case scenario will be recent childbirth, less than one year or less than two years. There will be a viral also same. Yeah, that postpartum is a very important immunological phenomena. Postpartum phase is the most prone phase of life for any immune disease. Most of the immune conditions will go into remission during pregnancy and they will flare up during postpartum phase. Now the Graves disease, you take any autoimmune disease during pregnancy. Many of the serious systemic inflammatory autoimmune conditions do not, they don't conceive. If they conceive, they usually go into the remission. Aprama on the postpartum state it will relapse. And that happens in thyroid conditions which are organ specific conditions. No, you will get a picture somewhat like this. It will, it will be like this. No, no, Graves disease, la, uptake will be like this. See here, you can see it. You can see it, but salivary gland is not aware of it. That means the gland is taking up all the technetium. It is not allowing the thai, uh, salivary and other people to take it. So it will be the whole, the gland will be intensely, you know, bright on the scan. So in the gland, you can see it blue, you can see it full, you can see it. That's the way Graves disease will look. I think there will be a photo of that. Yeah, this is much more easier. I think uh, 
I skipped one slide. Illa. Yeah. What is the catch point here? 32 year old female, she also comes with headache, weight gain, sleep, menstrual problem. T4 is low. TSH, you can see that it is normal. And I, I think in this one hour we have been discussing repeatedly only one point. When the T4 is low, TSH should go high. Illa. Very high. Nu paragunu, in and the very high good the high up there. That means what? TSH is not going high, means TSH is in problem. That means pituitary problem. So this is called secondary hypothyroid. So you can easily pick up or at least get the clue of a pituitary disease even by a simple thyroid function test. Not all patients with weight gain and menstrual problem is always primary hypothyroid. The unfortunate story is Suppose this patient had this free T4.32 and this TSH instead of 0.9 as 9, then also you should suspect pituitary case because that's the idea of conveying the message today that if the T4 is so low, I would have expected the TSH to be 90 or 100, not at 9. Upon an opinion, should take with pituitary. So, other routine PCOS married treatment in the manda koimido. Then you will miss the major pituitary condition in that patient. And in this case, you know, you evaluated for pituitary. Adi ke or or naale edpa edgalam how to evaluate pituitary. Anyway, this is pituitary tumor diagnosed, and the patient will get operated. So, next couple of minutes on uh, treatment of treatment pitfalls, which is very very common, useful pituitary case. You may not have every time seeing. You may not see. Let us take this scenario of a 24-year-old lady who had goiter and weight gain, irregular periods, cold in all classic symptoms. A classic hypothyroid, see very low free T4, very high TSH, primary hypothyroidism. She also checked her antibody which was positive. So what is the diagnosis? Autoimmune thyroid disease, Hashimoto or whatever you want to call it and leading to severe primary hypothyroidism, clear cut. And the patient was started on 100 microgram per day. Now we will start our discussion. After two months, her TSH was still 8.8. Why two months? Why not after two days? Why not after two weeks? Any scientific logic? Half-life. Half-life in Eras Onangla? Yeah, very correct. Thyroid's half-life is 7 to 10 days. So at least you should wait for four half-lives for any change in dosing or any TSH evaluation to be done. So usually we ask 6 to 8 weeks, that is two months. And her TSH is still not in our goal range. So it's still above the limit. So we increase the dose from 100 to 125. Then she comes at 1.8. Correct. Correct. See, first of all, check complaints. And the empty stomach and the gap, all those things. So then you advise, you send her. And also, you know, explain to her about pregnancy. Because during pregnancy, she should not stop and the dose should be probably increased. Suppose after a few years, a, a, such a patient comes with this kind of a report. What is your possibility? A patient known case of hypothyroidism, that patient is on thyroxine therapy and the dose 250 microgram per day. Let us take an average South Indian patient weighing 75 kg, 70, 75 kg. This is the report and that is the dose. Any, any antenna going up, red flag signs going up, those ages high, even without seeing, you can say. Patient 250 is 70 kg, 250 is high. I hope from today you will almost see this. And it is confirmed by our report also. Dose is high. It is the first diagnosis. Very correct. Overdose. Suppose this was the report. How will you explain? Free T4 is 0 0.8, TSH is 22. Excellent. Sayardhan correct. First diagnosis Adam. When somebody is on 250 microgram and the two with only 70 kg average adult dosing, adult dosing is not high dosing, I would have expected some report like this. But you see that even with 250 apparently, it looks like he is still hypothyroid. Primary hypothyroid. How can it happen? It can happen only if the patient is on glimepiride 4 milligram a day, metformin 1 gram twice a day, um, oh, insulin no, no, high dose low point, no, no sugar high arna. You put it on the first dose. <laughs> and diabetes analogy la sol no na free T4 is like sugar, TSH is like HbA1c. Your sugars can be normal, HbA1c is high. What is the diagnosis? Patient anni kundi matre put it on. first diagnosis da. If your sugars are very high, HbA1c is normal. Ab anni kundi matre put 
whatever he was otherwise regular but on the day of testing he probably did some bungling namm urla nare per insulin potukama marunda potukama sugar check pandra mari and the marudha idu this patient has taken the thyroxin on the day of testing or one or two days before testing adanal t4 is looking on the low normal or normal side but the tsh is high means he has not been taking it regularly before plus you also know from our usual logic unless there is a resistance patient which is extremely rare that thyroid dosing is also very high so he is a perfectly non compliant patient alladhu romba rare ah number la indala other differential is malabsorption see suppose innikala and morbid obesity la nariya paakrom 120 kg 140 kg patient vanda maybe this dose is right please remember that's why this dosing is important based on weight next case 1.8 which means free t4 is higher than normal still tsh is high what is what could be the possibility ellarkum thookam varudha nenikiraengala thyroid vandu ivar aruthun irukkaru nu paathu irukkaengala pituitary la and first common things common sir general practice office ah enna what was the word they used here office practice so it is clinical practice la paakuradha modala solluvom institutes la rare ah endocrine department la paakuradhu appuram vechikalam adhu rare ah vechikalam again the, see see here that this patient is uh, probably again compliance could be issue for all we know again this could be epdi solunga papa ama in the 250 romba regular ah ipo padrukara it's a, it's still a possibility they again compliance tha please understand that most of our patients who are not under good control it is most likely compliance over treatment under treatment treatment na not the dosing it is our way of taking you have to check whether this fellow took it exactly see this underdosing ku or double query potirukom parunga dose eppadi id underdosing id dose la kottame solla mudiyadhu dose in fact is high so the last situation is extremely rare that's why we put it last and we don't discuss it at all and we never discuss it in patients who are on high dosing you, see, you are giving so much dose and still tsh is never getting suppressed like this this is the way it should be that means tsh is not getting suppressed means the t4 receptors in the pituitary are not responding adu vand this is like the, you know the insulin resistance the typical type 2 diabetes lower insulin resistance is different the typical insulin resistance syndromes irukku adella vand pathinga insulin receptor eh defect insulin eh okkaradu poi andala rare conditions and the mari thyroid hormone resistance th is thyroid hormone resistance namba irs insulin resistance mari idu vand thr okay total hip replacement illa idu venda in the graves disease we have seen sir wanted to see one uptake this is not the typical uptake uh, this should be not seen this is normal uptake okay i think diabetes oda sendu ore or case one discuss pannuvanga yeah we'll discuss on subclinical hypothyroidism ts t4 is normal tsh elevated i think we have discussed it again i will revise it you go through this checklist you see whether the tsh is above 10 first antibody positivity iruka is there any dyslipidemia goiter subfertility or a young child with delayed bone age short stature you have any correlation you start treating otherwise repeat reassess then only start treating nodules we will not discuss because it will be a totally different situation i won't go into this so yeah, one clear cut message is treat the patient not the pep not the value is very important and when in doubt always reconfirm and correlate then the thank you ku apuram or rendu slide irukku idu ore 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 or quick ah idu mudichidalam see this is common what will you do this is diabetes with thyroid case situations 65 year old lady post menopausal master health checkup showing diabetes by definition post glucose value is 201 her tsh is also suppressed please repeat the gtt or what i mean the 0 and 2 over 75 gram glucose after making her u thyroid consider because if she is thyroiditis patient or graves disease patient hyperthyroidism thyrotoxicosis can cause hyperglycemia so don't treat put idu vandu or typical diabetes formula selvat enna solidum start on metformin abdin always look look into the other situation also sometimes you can have other conditions also happening and the approach to this kind of a patient as i have already told you is not ultrasound get a technician unless you have nodule don't check ultrasound and if the if the diffuse uptake we have already shown it is graves if it is totally absent it is thyroiditis which we have already seen 
and if it is not ULR, you have to look into other conditions. 58 year old lady, postmenopausal by more than 13 years, diabetes for 6 years, obese by our definition, on sulfonylurea and metformin, reasonable control, not very bad. She is very compliant with lifestyle measures. She was very happy that she lost 4 kgs in a matter of 2 months, but her sugars are worsening. Why? Weight correct, HB on silan decent are in the worsen of the you have to think of other and always glucose centric up outside pancreas think ponamo. Apri Pathingana, this lady might have thyrotoxicosis, especially today's situation. Especially the first question you ask is how is her appetite? If her appetite is good, and that's the important clinical point. Appetite is good, nan Allah sapra on all weight correct. There are only one or two DDs. One diabetes uncontrolled, where you will have good appetite and still weight like that. The classic uh, bedside teaching. First uh, diagnosis is uncontrolled diabetes and the second is uh, uncontrolled thyroid, thyrotoxicosis. And the third, guess the malabsorption, if it is not severe. And malnutrition, we have to eat the same thing. We have to eat the same thing. Okay. 42-year-old gentleman with uh, is, uh, no alcohol smoker, obese, he, is, he has diabetes by definition because the fasting sugar is high, he has dyslipidemia, all our atherogenic lipids are high LDL, low HDL, high triglyceride, uh, diabetes is uh, by definition, HbA1c definitionally in diabetes. See, I agree that this patient requires very strict uh, counseling on lifestyle measures, appetite, I mean, whatever uh, exercises, but in addition to checking all the other things and counseling on diet and exercise and maybe starting even on, even on metformin, statin border to minadi, please check thyroid also. He could be, uh, he could be very well a uh, hypothyroid patient. If you treat that, some of his dyslipidemia will get better. And an important point is in severely hypothyroid patients, statin-induced myopathy can be very severe. So at least in hypothyroid patients with dyslipidemia, treat thyroid first, then start on statins, at least for a few weeks before, even because sometimes the myopathy can be very severe. And that's what is, always think of secondary dyslipidemia in our patients. I think I'll stop here. The organizers are getting restless. Uh, if at all there are any questions, I will take it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent <coughs> speech. We got the pearls for practice on thyroid. You have witnessed everything, enjoy. And with this, I kindly accept your memento from the. Is there any questions? Yeah, we can allow just one or two questions. Any questions can come out. Oh, and the motocos mullangi kada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, in, in severe iodine deficiency areas, it used to be a common uh, advice to avoid certain goitrogens. Uh, the brassicae family, our cabbage, cauliflower, uh, turnip, and those uh, things, they, they inhibit, uh, they, have, they have thiocyanates in their, uh, in their chemistry. So, they will inhibit uh, the iodine uptake in the, by the thyroid. That was the logic. But as I said, after iodization, and when you are in iodine sufficiency areas, those uh, things need not be advised. Seafoods contain usually iodine more. We have this usual uh, uh, advice to our thyroid, hyperthyroid patients to avoid seafoods for certain period till their uh, autoimmune hyperthyroidism is under control. That's, uh, that's possibly more logical than actually advising everybody not to eat uh, cabbage, cauliflower. For a diabetic patient, you advise them to eat for, uh, vegetables and fruits. The leafy things will go. You can't. Uh, I don't think it's advisable in iodine sufficiency areas. Yeah. So you said uh, thyroxine dose 0.2 to 1.2 1 to 2 microgram. But sometimes I am tempted to give more thyroxine for very high TH levels. Is there any correlation? Just like high sugar, I give more insulin. Hmm. Less sugar, I give less insulin. High TH can give a little more dose. The usual rule is start slow and gradually uptight it. Usual rule. Especially in adult population, and that too we are discussing diabetes today, so also a lot of our diabetic patients can have incipient heart uh, issues, we won't know, especially elderly population. So always start slow, go slow with thyroid. It's general rule. 
not like the reverse. Start with high dose and step down. The asthma is not like that. The thyroid always starts low and go gradually. You said 10 to 15 percent of this thyroid rate is may go into remission. So some patients ask for about two to three years, shall I stop treatment? What is the answer? Or uh, clue. See, if they are on the full replacement, which you know from today, uh, from our discussion that uh, if a 60, 70 kg person is on 125-150 microgram thyroxin, it's full replacement. Usually, he won't, uh, he can come out. If suppose on 25 or 50 microgram, a 70 kg adult is having a normal TSH, maybe you can take this decision of withdrawing and seeing for some time. I, I hope I convey. When you insulin only less than 12 units per day, na nirti pakla, and that uh, less than 20 units na maybe somebody can in a 70 kg person. Are they 60 units, 70 units required? Matter of will be always get every nirti mudiyo. Insulin the day nirti maati na you will always have severe hyperglycemia. And the if they are on a small dose like 25 or 50, and still you have a normal or a low normal TSH or suppressed TSH, you can stop and see. That means they are going into uh, remission. It's very even though I give analogies from diabetes and insulin. It's not the same way it behaves inside. That's the problem. We have thyroid gland n number of times we see recovering. I don't see diabetes patients recovering that way. The beta cells are different. But the answer, I mean, the feedback is roughly the same. Yeah.